Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen momentarily. Thanks for that very energetic introduction, Charles. Appreciate that. Uh, that's probably the most energetic introduction I've ever had. <laughs> um, so I've got a bit of a confession. When I first agreed to do the talk, um, I went for something really safe because frankly, I didn't know a huge amount about sustainability and automotive, um, fairly new to this role, I'd say new, but I've been in it for about a year or so now. Um, I wasn't sure about how much of what we do is truly sustainable and what isn't. Uh, and as you hear from me in a bit, um, the automotive design industry itself is actually pretty wasteful historically, you know, huge carbon footprint. You've got shows all over the world pre COVID, um, you know, various sort of properties before you get to a point where you can, um, you can go to production with, with, um, with a particular intent. And so, you know, f for me, um, as it happened, when I accepted to do the talk, um, when I had that chat with Robert, um, I'm going to hide my little window here. There we go. When I had that chat with Robert initially, um, I started to do some research and, you know, following on from that, we, we want, we actually want a contract with a hyd commercial hydrogen vehicle startup. And simultaneously myself and my colleagues have been immersed in, um, ecosystem mapping for, um, uh, BSA motorcycles, you know, we're the design and prototyping lead in an electric motorcycle project. So I've really saturated myself in figuring out what's ecologically sound. And the point is, I thought it would be best to leave you with some interesting provocations instead. You know, maybe it'll actually have more impact, you know. So my side note with the word sustainability and one of my biggest gripes is that it's, it's quite an innocuous word. And this is something that one of my colleagues said, you know, how about something like averting ecological disaster? So uh, apologies to Robert and Amy and everyone else and Charles, um, but I changed my uh, my title to Green as the New Black. That's my first provocation. So you'll see those little numbers down the side. I'll only have five for you. My first question is, is it really fashionable to be talking about sustainability? You know, is that is that actually what we're doing here? Um, one of my um, um, one of our clients said to me yesterday, you know, self congratulation is kind of like an epidemic. You know, are we actually doing enough? You know, we're not. Are we just patting ourselves on the back? We're not Greta Thunberg, are we? We didn't skip school to make a point here. Um, but I think, you know, if we were to change that language ever so much, you know, um, and set the context into a more depressing sort of tone, and I'll promise I'll rein it back, forget boomers, zennials, millennials, whatever, you know, we're all actually just colonials. And, you know, I'll invent a word here to describe what I'm about to tell you. We are killing the planet. Um, but the narrative really is that we're saving it, you know, so for the most part, um, the disasters that we've, we've talked about for the past 30 years or so haven't been averted, you know, ozone layer from when I was a kid, dwindling sort of oil reserves, um, global warming, all of those kind of things and pollution of the sea. So I thought I'd just focus on one of those sort of narratives. Um, um, you know, I could certainly go into electric cars and you know how they'll create problems of their own and you know we'll have uh, depleting resources due to the manufacture of those um but we do feel pretty good that we're doing something about it so if there's one phrase to sort of you know try and fashion it would be you know we're we're really all kind of this in the same boat you know it doesn't matter you know what we're trying to do we're um, we're, we're living on the same planet and if we're okay with that definition, hopefully, you know, you'll be pretty receptive to the rest of this talk. And if I'm wrong about any of those areas, please, please, you know, engage me in conversation. I've already had a couple of people sort of reach out. So, you know, the, the last thing I want to kind of be doing is just kind of rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic. So by 2050, I read that there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Um, I'm sure someone out there has dismissed it as some kind of alarmist um liberal fantasy but you know we humans designers love making things out of uh, uh non-renewable resources and we use fossil fuels to to create plastic uh, and though eventually they're all run out we use them to make everything and you know including 3d printer filament as well you know it's something that we use all the time but it's not hard to say that, you know, it's not hard to investigate whether there are better sort of greener sort of alternatives. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those sort of drivers in a little bit as well, but I want to kind of share a few sort of funny things. Don't screenshot this, you know, uh, 
but effectively you know i recently um uh, through one of my colleagues requested some ocean plastic filament which is you know presumably made from plastic destined for the sea that's a bit of a stretch really or recovered from the sea so in this instance i think it's made from um you know the the nylon that they use in sort of fishing nets they kind of use a chemical process and mechanical process and they get it back into this sort of filament form it's pretty nice aesthetically not that we use those sort of type of finishes but look at what it came sort of wrapped in you know more plastic and i think this is this is the whole sort of lack of attention to sort of detail you know making an environmentally product isn't just about avoiding plastic obviously it's about what happens backstage it's about you know how much water a company uses you know how much waste they generate where it sources the materials what it does with that sort of waste um, you know, do they have unnecessary trips? Do they work remotely? All, all of those kind of things sort of feed into it. So, you know, we've got to we've got to effectively sort of start somewhere. But ocean plastics is a funny one, really, because another example that I really, really love, and this is going on to provocation number two, is that so you know, a while back, Tom Ford introduced um this luxury watch, an ocean plastic luxury watch. I mean, what what of this watch is actually ocean plastic well it's a strap it's hand woven you know so how, how are they doing that i don't know i'm sure you can sort of read the story but it's a 900 pound sort of product um it's effectively just the strap and the sort of working sort of parts of the watch now tom ford as a fashion designer how about you just don't do that in the first place how we don't don't make that particular you know how, how is that going to enrich someone's life necessarily i'm not you know just saying it for the sake of it but you know some of these gestures as as much as they might have other things going on as well that are very noble are really just terrible you know they're, they're just not they're kind of silly you know so don't make stupid things and you know the second provocation is really about figure out what the sort of correct things are to make you know don't don't buy things that um you know are aren't ecologically sound in the first place and the same sort of gripe that i have and maybe i don't understand it that well but with with things like carbon offsetting you know it's not quite the same as not doing that thing in the first place. Uh, and moving on, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by images. I'm sure, you know, loads of other people are and watching some of the presentations yesterday as well when we're talking about sort of, um, uh, sort of design and, you know, the impact that that could have in shaping consumer sort of perceptions. I mean, look at this sort of imagery. You know, if you just do a quick Google search on, on, on your browser in another tab, um, look at the articles that mention, um, ocean plastic you know they've got such pretty images you know to me that's that's really interesting it's art almost you know it's not like the sort of exxon valdez shell oil spills you know some poor seabird sort of choking on some oil it's not any of that it's almost glamorizing it you know that sea is going to look way more boring and pedestrian if it didn't have that stuff in it and look at this you know look at all this 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 kind of mountain of like plastic it just looks it's almost like they're they're kind of glamorizing it really Anyway, I'm going to reel it back a little bit and talk a little bit about us now that I've hopefully got your attention. So we're Vital. Uh, we're an industrial design studio with an insane amount of experience in automotive. That's to say that we combine um, deep manufacturing expertise in how to make physical objects, prototypes, be it a seat, an aircraft wing, a model of a car, um, and you know all the engineering that goes into sort of doing those things. Um, but we kind of combine that so sort of making layer with a consultancy layer so the you know the making and the thinky so we understand imagine and make and i think that's what potentially sort of makes us special that when we're consulting even on a purely technical level or conceptual level we're giving design input um we're also the people who know how to make the thing so it's not conjecture or estimation we know exactly how it's made what it'll cost all of that i think that's part of the sort of eco sort of journey as well to actually figure out what is the true cost over the lifetime of a product of this um you know of this particular uh, object that's being made and i think that's really important when people come to us to kind of take a concept from sketch to any one of these sort of different outcomes whether it's a car show whether you know it's a hypercar destined for the racetrack or a family car whatever it is you know uh, if it's a, an art object that goes in the gallery we've, we've actually got um we've just done two exhibitions one is um you know a collaboration with um robert melville who's um the chief designer at mclaren but we're doing you know a giant mickey uh, apocalyptic looking mickey with him 
um, you know, uh, we, we really kind of consider what the lifetime of that sort of product is, you know, and it's not so much these days about cradle to grave, it's really cradle to cradle, you know, how, how is it actually circular? Is, is that um, motorcycle that we're making going to be owned by somebody else? You know, what are the interactions that we need to design into the ecosystem of that product? And so we've been very fortunate to work with new and old brands. Um, this is just a tiny smattering of the sort of brands, 60 or so that we've worked with. And I think, um, again, just to, I don't want to dwell too much on what Vital does and doesn't, but it is relevant. You know, we, when we were founded in 2015, you know, uh, the company had a very ballistic trajectory. I, although I only joined last year, the first job that the company had was for an XTV Neo. Um, there's a great documentary on YouTube about it. You know, Vital led the whole design program for um, Neo and delivered six show cars to the Shanghai um, uh, 2017 Shanghai Motor Show in under 10 months. So, you know, you can imagine like the level of skill required and, you know, how much work goes in and how many people are involved in delivering clay models, ergonomic models, design and volume models, you know, sign off properties, all of those things for interior, exterior, key fobs, wearable design. Um, and again, with it, you can imagine all the sort of potential waste there is as well with, with all of those sort of components. So it's so important what we do that, you know, if we're helping uh you know an oem create stuff um you know how is it that we're actually sort of doing that and so another way of looking at all of this is everything that we make is content so everything we do is in the service of creating content a physical model is content to me a virtual model is content so if our job is just to create content then what are the more optimal ways to create that sort of content? So this is like one of the little side insights, you know, like if, if, if you think about the meta level of what it is that we do, um, if you're in the print industry, if it's communication, if it's uh, someone in the digital industries, what is it, you know, are you trying to kind of affect a conversion? You know, what are the ways in which you can sort of do that? So the content that we create is for design evaluation, either internally at the OEMs, so the manufacturers, for marketing purposes to the consumer and ultimately it's used to make better decisions do i need this thing or not and um you know it's used to set high level sort of design steer um and we were kind of set up and still are to use emerging uh, technologies in manufacturing and so that's that's why you know 3d printing is such a huge part of what we do and again i won't bore you with this sort of side of things but you know it's a huge sort of range of stuff that we do under one roof and i think that's an, that's an interesting aspect, you know, doing everything under one roof means that, you know, we don't have to outsource stuff, um, although we do on occasion outsource things to, you know, far off places, um, you, you know, the, 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 the key sort of thing is that we try to do as much of it under one roof. And this aligns with our sort of personal sort of mission and sustainability journey as well. So we chose that sort of future direction based on sustainability, as I found out as I was doing more investigation on what it is we, we actually do that's sustainable. So here's some shots of our studio. It looks really cool. Everyone seems to comment on that. You know, it's certainly something that drew me to, to, to Vital many, many years ago before I actually joined them. Um, our youngest sort of person is 19 and, you know, more senior people out there are in their 60s, you know, their, their dads and granddads. And, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a few of us, you know, not pictured here, but we do everything from, you know, chip and board level PCB electronics to, to kind of the HMIs that go in vehicles. And, um, you know, some of the properties just look absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, they, they look as, um, production spec as possible but we also actually create parts that, that go into um, production vehicles you know limited run 300 or so um, uh, parts potentially um, this is our clean room when we where we do the manufacturing again on site in the same space and uh, production starts yes this year on the um, e heart for the pin and farina batista i know because some of the attendees um in this conference as well, actually, who know me reached out to me to say that they've recently seen this at a car show. Um, so that's that's something that we've made. It's this um, electronic sort of component at the back of the vehicle that effectively acts as the heart of this electric vehicle. Um, and, you know, we also do like design investigations, um, understanding a future area. So in this instance, it was something we did for the innovation showcase at the museum. It's um, using machine learning and pose estimation in particular 
to kind of look at how pedestrians and autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles interact with each other. And so by looking at interactions, you know, what if uh, effectively by understanding how pedestrian uh, and their intent is recognized by a vehicle, uh, we can send the right signal, you know, it's a com communication between the pedestrian and the, the car and we can save energy. We don't start and stop as often because the car sees the, the pedestrian, the pedestrian sees that the car has seen it and they've communicated together using some kind of non-verbal format using the lights on the uh, front of the grill. And so uh, he here's a really interesting example as well because the bus that you see behind it, um, you know, again, that's like a, a it's a train uh, not bus. It's a uh, you know intended to 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 kind of um, be semi-autonomous as well. Um, I have a feeling that it has sensors near the the bottom of the uh, the, the the vehicle front, and as as a result, you know it can detect when someone is close to it. Now it doesn't have cameras, but what if you know kids start sort of tripping that up, trying to kind of see how how it stops whenever, <laughs> whenever, whenever it comes near it, you know, and, and I think this, this is this level of sort of interaction design is, is something that we're investigating, we're looking at, and what if experiential sort of technologies had the same level of sort of depth to, um, for example, give a driver the sensation that, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, really pressing down on the accelerator using haptics and whatever, where, when in actual fact, it's not doing that, and it's driving far more sensibly, you know, the, the car is adapting to the driving style and making it more eco-friendly. So, you know, there's a huge aspect of sort of um, material intelligence and there's a huge aspect of the interaction design intelligence that I think could be helping us, um, you know, to rein in this sort of conversation again, you know, in this sort of, it seems like I'm obsessed with uh, ocean plastic now, but to reframe the disaster into some kind of opportunity requires us to kind of effectively sort of ask these sort of what if questions, you know, what if doing the more sustainable thing was actually the more profitable sort of avenue to sort of look at, you know, I guarantee you that in your business, um, there are more sustainable ways of doing things of everything. And we just haven't figured it out yet. So, you know, for, for creating products, you know, what if the total cost of ownership were to consider all these different sort of components, how can you change some aspect of that sort of piece of communication or that, you know, um, uh, product that's being generated um, to, to have like a longer term sort of impact. So to give you a very practical example, we um, we run um, 3D printers um, day and night and, you know, the, the new ones that we have consume something like 40 to 50 percent let's say 45 percent less uh, electricity than than the um than the older ones and so this allows us more design iterations and loops and effectively we're creating better products for our customers so you know maybe maybe it's something as simple as upgrade your gear you know that could be that could be another sort of way of looking at it the other one is to to effectively try and um make less but make better things you know to have a more strategic use of experiential technology in in my field um would would be to use say virtual production to um consider um you know using that over shooting um these cars in uh different environments you know same thing you know the end effect is effectively the same but you're using technology very sort of effectively as well and some of the um sort of partners um at this event as well you know are effectively specialists of this area uh, people like um explore so i also want to sort of talk about how you can layer a lot of these things together and so just to bring it back into sort of our world and what we do um when we're sort of printing we use um filament that is um, effectively um, a, a polymer that's um, a, a, th a thermoplastic. It's made from renewable sources such as cornstarch instead of um, using um, uh, industrial sort of materials that, you know, are made from petroleum. And I think, um, you know, th this this was something that I kind of, uh, I, I wasn't sure about the claim until I saw it in, 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 in all the work that we do. Um, uh, and the majority of the kind of um, snapshot models that we make, um, 
you know, you can obviously see that it's just a snapshot of the vehicle for evaluation purposes, whether it's kind of ergonomic assessment or, um, you know, things like reachability or visibility um, or testing out a, an interface. That's one layer, which is don't make the whole thing, make a snapshot of it, um, make it out of uh, sustainable material. The other one is to effectively use AR. And I wish I could show you some of the really uh, amazing looking sort of properties that we've been using AR for recently. Um, this is, you know, this is one vehicle that we can sort of talk about uh, and show, but, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, unfortunately, we can actually uh, physically show, but we use AR a lot in um, uh, demonstrating variations in products, finishes, uh, and we also use VR in the um, interior sort of evaluation. So you don't have to, you know, kit out every single sort of um, version of a, a snapshot with different sort of um, materials. You can just see it um, in VR. And obviously it's not as good, but it's good enough to an extent and it costs less um, and effectively allows you to combine all these different sort of techniques in order to, um, to, to evaluate something um, more effectively. So as you know, for two sort of bonus provocations, you know, I think uh, as designers, we're really good at kind of um, looking at, you know, what our options are and um, working to certain constraints and budgets. And so, you know, in, in our way, it's, you know, when do you go from digital um, design to something tangible? And we all have those sort of questions, you know, where, how far, how long can you leave it basically before you go into something tangible that is obviously very resource intensive. I'm not saying digital isn't resource intensive, but it's certainly less resource intensive. Um, you know, and you can apply this to print or any other sort of area of interactive as well. Um, so, you know, is, is what we do as designers really, you know, that key sort of point of responsibility is it the right way? Is there a better way to do this thing? That's a question that we should always be asking. There's a secondary sort of provocation as well, you know, just to leave it there with you. Um, what, you know, the, the real sort of enemy here of sustainability is, is that complacent attitude. Ah, oh, well, it's someone else's problem. Someone else is going to sort through our waste. Someone else is going to figure out that bit or the client hasn't requested it. Why would I rock the boat? Well, Frankly, if the client hasn't requested it now, they probably will in the future, very sh near future. And you can come up with your own sort of analogy. But if I were to leave you with one, it's that effectively, what if if someone says, why would I rock the boat? You can basically say that, you know, <laughs> you won't be going anywhere if, you know, you're you're going to die as a sort of a dinosaur on that sort of hill. Like, you know, the the boats won't be going anywhere if they're in a sea of plastic. So do rock that boat, um, do sort of figure out which opportunities there are for you to personally affect the journey of making products for your clients. Thank you very much. That's, that's me. I hope I uh, kept the time roughly. <laughs> Thank you, Shay. You have um, very much the time and uh, really interesting uh, presentation. Very interesting to hear what you said about uh, not rocking the boat. I think one of the reasons why we face such a significant environmental and sustainability challenge is that arguably historically organizations have taken the benefit of using resources wastefully and allowed other people to pick up the cost. So um, that, that's something that I think is changing. And I also very strongly believe that a lot of improving sustainability is about good business practices, about efficiency, about reducing waste. I've really just got one question, which which I thought was really Obviously, Vital Auto are um, very much, uh, I guess, client commission led. My sense is that sustainability features really strongly in all your thinking. Is that driven by the clients or is that just within the DNA of Vital Auto? Uh, some of our clients are incredibly sort of um, conscious of sustainability as it's, you know, part of their story is, um, you know, they tend to be the the kind of the the startups, the the smaller sort of um, um, you know, I wouldn't say lesser known, but the 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 you know the the ones who are using it as their unique sort of selling point almost. Mm -hmm. um, but across the board, you know, it's uh, you know it's something that is being considered in automotive. You know, we're looking at sort of monomaterials, we're looking at mo modularity, we're looking at 
making things in ways that increase the sort of lifespan of the product and g genuinely i mean I, you know it might have sounded like it's it's all doom and gloom because i'm trying to kind of provoke here a little bit but cars are lasting longer and if we can avoid the sort of fashions that we used to sort of fall into um you know the total cost of ownership is is sort of going lower as well you know over the lifetime of a product um and so i think it really is a responsibility of us as designers to try and design things that also don't sort of fall out of fashion as as quickly as they do and it's really hard and this is something that we always say and my um my colleague andy sort of um just just before this call sort of started he sent me um uh, he sent me um <laughs> we, we we have like the whatsapp sort of uh, group and he just sent me some sort of visions of you know what used to what used to effectively go for um uh, car interiors in the past and they look so futuristic you know the 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 stuff from the 1980s in particular just looks so contemporary i'm just looking over at my phone here and uh obviously i'm gonna try and show you that there but it looks it looks incredible you know it's uh yeah. it's it's a vision right there but we're, we're <laughs> this particular industry is very led by these sort of fashions and i think you know that there's definitely scope to kind of rethink what sort of timelessness in design sort of looks like and feels like and you know how we can sort of create some kind of emotional durability in products uh, and it really it honestly it spans beyond automotive you know how how do you get to love a product more because you know you've repaired it you know that you've 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 added something to it you know the the ikea effect effectively of making the product makes you want to keep it and I think larger sort of corporations have an even greater sort of responsibility to 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 for the circularity so sort of journey and it will be more profitable for them as well right so you know for for Tesla to keep upgrading its cars with you know free software updates so that they become more sellable means that they can then start giving them add-ons as well in the future as well so or when we're thinking about um, technologies that go into uh, vehicles let's not skimp out and go with what was homologated you know five years ago let's go for something that is very future facing and we're always trying to push that you know so if there is an opportunity to put a more powerful sort of computer within uh, a, an hmi for a vehicle then we'll absolutely recommend that because we know that you know the the moment that sort of becomes underpowered to deliver some of the software updates then the customer feels like it's clunky and doesn't sort of behave as well and perform as well. It's the same product. It's just, you know, different, it's running different code. So let's go for something a bit more beefier to, to kind of mitigate that. So yeah, there's a whole approach related to interaction design and, um, um, you know, technology choices that I think will, will go a long way there as well. But ultimately yeah. it's a designer's choice. It's kind of ironic how quickly modern goes out of fashion, isn't it? And uh, absolutely. Uh, and I think your point about timeless design is so true. And I, I wonder whether we're seeing a, um, a a shift in culture actually to again the old cliche is buy you know buy well buy once actually. Um, and and it's that emotional thing of of buying a product that you really love. I know what I'm like. I'll keep forever actually. But, yeah, that, that so so I I think popular culture is really important to sort of listen out for cues on. Um, so, you know, I'm a big Reddit user and there's a buy it for life subreddit where people um, just sort of post all the products that have lasted 20, 30 years for them. You know, whether they're the shoes, jackets, whatever it is. And, you know, this is a, there's a whole sort of yeah. tribe of, of people who are looking at those sort of things because, you know, I think fashion is is will ultimately become very unfashionable, you know, it'll become the thing that you'll you know point fingers to and say oh that's that's terrible what a dreadful choice you've made you know that's a, yeah. that i think that's going to happen and I, i'm seeing that in sort of younger people um you know i'm, I'm 40 um next uh, in a few in a few months so um i'm, I'm kind of <laughs> considering um myself to be one of those sort of millennials and learning from the younger sort of generation including my son who's four years old and you know talks about the environment it's like well where is he learning that you know is it the cartoons that he's watching you know that that kind of cultural programming is is very relevant and important yeah we've got a session later on about actions versus words and i think um 
that's that's a really really interesting area. Um, one quick question come up on the chat, and then I'll let you go because uh, it's hugely appreciative of the time you, you've put in to today. And that question is: um, Is Vital Audio Auto? Sorry, I keep saying. Sorry, that. Don't worry, we, we had it on radio as well. Some uh, one of the presenters just kept calling us Vital Auto. I, I, I don't like, know why awesome. I've got that. I apologize for that. <laughs> I have to um, you know, it's once you, once you do it once, it keeps happening, unfortunately. And the question is, uh, are, you know, are Vital Auto taking on the responsibility of leading rather than following the client brief? Yes, yeah. Um, th there have been instances where we've genuinely rocked the boat. You know, I can, I can say that hand on heart that, you know, when we're doing the ecosystem mapping or when we're recommending sort of products, we, we will absolutely put forward what we think is both ecologically sound and profitable. And genuinely, the options now uh, are far easier to justify. It, mm. it, it's coming to a point where the unsustainable sort of approach is actually more costly. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, combine that with sort of policy that's going to hit as well, then, you know, it's an absolute no brainer that we should be doing that. And, um, you know, as I said, we, we, we've got design investigations as well, uh, using some of the sort of more artistic outputs and the creative forms to explore um, you know, what it what it could mean to be using these things more creatively and creating more sort of durable um, finishes and products for um, automotive in some respects, but, you know, also seating and, you know, um, different sort of um, products as well that we're working on with some of our clients. Again, yeah, some, some themes that come through and we'll wrap up in a second, but it's that you're know, buying well, but but actually spending a bit more money on quality that then lasts. And you talked about learning from the younger generation. I've, I've got sort of children who are just at the end of their teens and early 20s. Actually, I run it, I think we've got some things to learn from the older generations as well. Maybe even skipping my parents' generation to their parents. Absolutely. In terms of repairing and, uh, and designing products to be repairable and then having the skills to repair, which with YouTube, ironically, makes, makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, well, that's that's a really great point. I will definitely incorporate that into because I mean another thing is that you know vital. Um, as I mentioned, we've got you know the the vast generational sort of gulf, but you know we're all in the same space. We're all working together. So you know, youngest person is nineteen, oldest is in their sort of late sixties. So we're effectively um, you know learning how to make things together. And um, it's funny because yesterday we had. Um, um, Kevin, sort of, who's, who's one of the more senior sort of people, um, and he was buying his son a, a, a VR headset. So he used one of our sort of Oculus headsets in the space, and you know all the other guys are like ribbing him and whatnot. And it was interesting to kind of just see how they realize, you know, once they've, they've tried it for themselves, they realize that what we're actually doing, you know, when we're sketching properties in VR. You know is better is you know it has this sort of salience to it that is relevant to to what we do so we've got these little nudges and touch points throughout the whole sort of um, process but yeah learning from them has been amazing you know we've got mark who has many many motorcycles he repairs them he you know he creates new contraptions and you know it's, it's it's just great it's a wonderful environment to be in and uh, welcome anyone to come and have a look well, that sounds great. So uh, I will let you go. I did promise I would about 10 minutes ago, but uh, uh, thank you very much for presenting today. I hope you have a, a fantastic day. Um, so huge thanks uh, to everyone who's uh, with us today. Our next session will actually start at 10.15, uh, and that's a session uh, led by Steve Middleton, who's a director at Cellar Glass in partnership with Olga Munro from the Retail Institute. So I look forward to seeing you in uh, just over 15 minutes. Thank you.